Hello, everybody. Thanks uh, for being here. Uh, so my name is Alessio Malizia, as you can read over there. Probably my British accent sounds Italian, <laughs> because I'm Italian. I'm originally from Rome, uh, the capital. Um, and so I'll give you a brief overview of what, more or less, I did in the past. Uh, you know, research. Um, some projects, uh, fundraising, and also I'll try to update of what I'm working currently that might be of interest for you as well, I suppose. So a bit of background, I would say that probably my research uh, could be described as ubiquitous interaction, ubiquitous in the sense of ubiquitous computing. Don't know if you're familiar with the term, but more or less was this vision that Mark Weiser had in 1997 at the Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center, w there was about this idea of <coughs> the computer disappearing in the environment. So going towards a more natural interaction for humans and computer, sort of the idea that the computer will basically disappear from our desk <laughs> and become part of uh, our environment. So the environment would be more intelligent and from another point of view would offer a more natural interaction with people, right? And we are very close to that vision now. That was 97. If you think about it, now we have computers in our own cars, uh, even in the fridge. We carry computers, you know, all time in our smartphones. So they're everywhere, really. And they're not so, you know, they're still on our desk, but they, you know, they basically are everywhere now, really. So that was the vision. And, um, and actually, I should mention that in this slide, what I did, just to tell you a little bit about me, on the left, on this column, you could see the industrial experience. And this horizontal line is the academic experience. So in terms of industrial experience, I work from some research centers. I spent a couple of years at the park, the Palo Alto Research Center. This was, that was very exciting, because actually, my field is human-computer interaction. So I have a background in computer science, but always work with humans, with the users. And I will show you later on, that in particular, in the last few years, I've been working a lot with designers, actually. Um, so um, yeah, Xerox Park, and then I have a long, sort of long-lasting collaboration with the Mitsubishi Electric Research Laboratory. They work a lot on human-computer interaction as well. They're in Boston. This is the, they're different labs. There's even a lab in Glasgow, actually. This one is the main lab in Boston. And um, I hope at a certain point I could try to invite someone to give a talk around. Perhaps the folks in Glasgow would be easier. Uh, then, yeah, talking about ubiquitous interaction, probably this was one of the main sort of European projects I work on in which we put together this expertise on uh, uh, advanced visualization and ubiquitous interaction was a bit scary, though, because they all this was FP6, if you're familiar with the research framework program. So we are talking around 2004, 2006, more or less, that time frame. And this was about um, introducing a 4D interface for air traffic controllers. That's why it was scary, because we were, th you know, we were thinking about what if we fail, right? We didn't fail, but didn't become mainstream as well. As always, as always, is a research project. So we end up with a working prototype that look a bit more like natural and uh, sort of usable for air traffic controller than the one they were using before. But of course, as long as you try to go <coughs> even, let's say, uh, beyond the third dimension, interactions become quite complicated. So. 4D means that there was also time involved in the interface. So there was even prediction of the trajectories of the different aircraft that when they were, for instance, approaching an airport. So there was a bit of, in a 3D sort of representation. So it was quite complicated. A lot of funding. This was almost 2 million euros and different universities. Actually, I must say in this project, we had middle sex, so we ran experiments with users in Ciampino, one of the Rome's airport, <laughs> and in Stansted here in London. And then, you know, before that, my industrial experience comes from IBM and Silicon Graphics, 
and I was really more like a computer scientist at that time. From the academic point of view, at a certain point I decided to go back to academia, study my PhD, and then going towards this kind of career, which I really liked. And so I got my PhD in Rome, a university at Sapienza University. Then I spent a few years, uh, years in Spain, in Madrid, at University of Carlos III, in a human-computer interaction group as associate professor. A few years ago, I moved to Brunel University here in London, and now I'm here. I hope to stay for a long time, possibly. <laughs> So, um, yeah, at a certain point I wrote also a book uh, entitled Mobile, Tr Mobile 3D Graphics. It's quite, it was quite interesting at that time. It was like 2006. It was the first book. If you go on Wikipedia, you would see it was the first book on Mobile 3D Graphics. And it was a lot about, um, well, it's a Springer book, so it's about research, really, but there are two, three chapters more on sort of practical examples, because it was the beginning of developing like 3D graphics on mobile devices. Uh, possibly the interesting thing about this book is that the first two chapters, which were about the challenges, but they're still there. The challenges are still there, they're still open. Difference has been that now software and hardware progress so much that actually we don't even need to have specific 3D graphics API. So now on an iPhone or on Android, there's a lot of libraries available. You can even use 3D modeling software to 3D model directly and you know, generate a file that can be run on a mobile phone. At that time, you had to use APIs like OpenGL for embedded systems. So it was a lot more about programming than modeling at that time. We didn't have the right tools still. It was the beginning of this field. And, but the challenges are still there. And it's interesting because there are challenging about challenges about usability, Challenging about battery. You know, you want to run 3D graphics on a mobile phone, you're still going to consume lots of battery. So when you want to program something, especially if it's about, you know, sprites, 3D graphics, well, you have to run certain kinds of optimization. So it's not just programming, you have to look for, uh, you know, for the resources that are available and trying to be, uh, let's say, tech-savvy in the sense of being very careful about consuming the power and resources of the phone. So I'll give you now a quick overview of different projects I'm working on and research and see whether you might be interested in something like that or perhaps in some of the topics and we can discuss about it. So I would say, I'll show you four main topics. So the first one, I would call it like, well, pervasive computing is really a a synonym of ubiquitous computing. So it's again about systems that disappear in the environment and are sort of natural for a, a user to interact with and intelligent user interfaces. So for instance, uh, one topic is I've been working on is Internet of Things, so which to me is actually a sort of an implementation of the ubiquitous computing vision, right? This is a vision that is coming. There's already a lot of buzz around Internet of Things. Basically, it's the idea is that over time, I think already now, there's more uh, traffic on the internet generated by devices than by humans. And these are devices talking to other devices. So computers talking to each other, ideally to generate some intelligent behavior that can be useful for humans, of course. The ultimate purpose is to be useful for us, right? And in terms of Internet of Things, um, there are some frameworks around, but you can run a lot of interesting scenarios. So I think this can be a scenario of interest for you. This was an installation in a museum about the First World War. And you can see there's a sort of a transparent display there. And there's an artifact behind the display. So basically what we did, what uh, was done was, there was an app. So basically the user could use his own mobile phone with the app. And by interacting through the phone, for instance, that there were different controls, imagine, could act on the controls. And for instance, uh, there was um, a servo motor uh, below the artifact. So imagine the user could actually rotate the artifact and look at the artifact from all different perspectives without touching it, because that's something the museum didn't want, of course. At the same time, since the transparent screen is also digital, you could project like stories, videos, on top of the object, right? You can even leave comments through your smartphone. 
So there was a sort of um, a collaborative interaction around uh, artifacts, but also a physical interaction. So you could really move or rotate the artifact, and this controlled by your phone. So it was basically the phone talking to the motors. So it was a kind of interaction between devices and with users at the same time. But this is a scenario. There might be many of those, right? Um, in terms of pervasive computing, this is a prototype, and I will show you an evolution of this uh, just at the end of this talk. This is pr probably the last development of this prototype. But mainly here, the idea is that we have many apps around. Probably we want to personalize those apps or do something with different apps, but that will require programming, right? And then end, end users and customers can't program, and they don't want to learn programming just for doing some specific things, because it's hard to learn programming. So the whole idea I here is block-oriented programming. Actually, in this system, you would see this is an interactive tabletop, so you can interact with your hands. You will see different, they look like puzzle pieces, really. So whenever you drop your phone on the surface, you will see this halo appearing. And basically, you can put together different services, like a almost like a workflow. So one service would be the output, the input of one service would go into another, and the output of another can become the input of the uh, following one. So basically, you are programming, but actually using puzzles. So it's a sort of very simple metaphor that everybody can understand. So in this example, for instance, you have a block for your Dropbox folder. So as long as you put the block in the hello, uh, your smartphone will display a keyboard to insert your key, uh, you know, password and login for login to your Dropbox folder. And then, for instance, as long as you use an input shape, you will have this other shape for the output, and you can decide to use this block, which is a display. So that means that the smartphone will retrieve on your Dropbox folder a file, and we show you it on the interactive surface. So you can share a document in a meeting to discuss with the other with no programming, basically, just using this. And of course, the system is, I have this framework, so I'm very interested if you can find scenarios so you want to use it. This can, is born to be extended. So we can design different shapes of the puzzle pieces and link to the shapes different services and functionalities. Right. Um, so it's really programming, but block-oriented, based on blocks. So relatively simple. And this is, to me, a way of opening those systems to end users. Because many times, we as designers or computer scientists slash designers, we can't really know what the user really wants to do with our system. This way, the user is personalizing the system as he or she likes. Uh, this is another kind of, uh, again, application. This is about intelligent user interfaces. Um, this is funded by EPSRC. It's a project that we land in February, this, well, next year, February 2018. was a call entitled The Future of Design. Actually, I'm working with designers on this project. The whole idea is that um, it's applied in mechanical engineering. So those are people designing mechanical parts and products that are related to mechanical elements. Uh, the thing is, when you design new product, we are always this problem. Uh, we're working with Crown Technologies, which is a company that is actually, uh, basically they do um, uh, cans, bottles, and you know, they're sort of very big. Their clients are like Coca-Cola company, so they do, they're very big business. One problem they had designing new kind of, um, you know, bottles or cans was always that they could have new ideas, because of course, you know better than me, right? When you design, it's about the functionalities, it's about the shape, it's about the materials, uh, it's about the aesthetics as well, if you like. So there are so many components in your sort of invention, in your new design, right? A problem was um, basically litigation. So many times, and today is more and more often, there are so many patents out there that actually design is working on an idea, works for a while, ends up with a prototype, and then there's um, no normally an office after that about intellectual properties that is going to check existing patents, trying to find overlapping or helping writing the patents properly, properly to defend the idea, right? But this comes at the end of the process. 
So the whole idea with this system is, what if we can help the designer while the designer is designing at the very beginning of the process? So from one point of view, reducing the cost of litigation, because you can discover while you are designing which kind of patents overlaps, uh, overlap with your design. At the same time, this will foster innovation, because you might discover, for instance, that you use a particular material or a particular shape here that overlaps with 10 existing patents. Well, at this stage, you might still think to change the shape or to go for a similar material that actually is not listed in overlapping patents. So from one point of view, it's a protection from litigation in an early stage. From another point of view, it's a way of fostering innovation because Soto suggests to you that, well, where, there's, where there are few overlappings, there's still space for innovation. When there are many overlappings, probably you might want to go for a, a different choice. Um, then there's another topic, which is more like social networks and interactive systems. It's, a, again, a human-centered perspective. Um, I don't want to spend much time on this. Um, those are systems that uh, I participated in, and we developed a social storyboarding system. But I think this is more relevant, and I'm still working on this bit, virtual trades. So the whole idea is this is about how people um, browse information. Okay, you can use it on the internet. Actually, we ran some experiments with our algorithms, but it can be in general whenever someone is use browsing a collection of documents. So the whole idea here is um, a sort of um, a metaphor and assume modeling the human as a virtual ant, you know, like the insects, the ants, right? So they're very clever, uh, especially as a swarm, when they act all together, right? So the whole idea is here is that whenever you browse a collection of documents, it could be even the internet, so um, you know, you're searching for keywords, you're looking at different documents. Well, whenever you find something relevant, basically you leave a trail. So let's say the steps you took to reach from the starting point to the document that was relevant for you, Will, uh, will be actually recorded by the system. So it will generate like a big graph. The thing is, basically, we are mimicking what the ants do when they're foraging for food. So whenever something relevant is found, well, that means that that path will be reinforced. So there will be some specific weights, some information that will tell us, look, someone found this path useful. And then useful for what? You want to also have some keywords understanding what the user did. The interesting bit about this kind of metaphor is that just like ants, we're mimicking pheromone. So if over time people change their choices because a new document appears and it's more relevant at that time with respect to old ones, actually those weights, those paths, will evaporate. Like that will happen in reality with the chemistry of the pheromone basically. So it's also dynamic. It's not just a static graph, it's dynamic. We just published a paper where we compared this against Google, uh, Yahoo, and Wikipedia search engine. We are close to Google, not as good as Google, but we're better than the Yahoo and Wikipedia search engine. Okay. For some kind of specific queries, not in general. Okay. So this can demonstrate to work very well for informational and transactional queries. So when you're looking for some information, facts, for instance, or when you're looking for, for instance, buying an item. So there are certain specific kind of information which this is very good. So this might be another source of inspiration about you know, browsing collection of documents. This perhaps can be quite relevant for you as well, might be of interest. This is research I did on multimodal systems I'm still doing. Um, this one is about emotions, and I think emotions are very important if we want people to interact with systems in a natural way. We are not separated from our emotions in our life, right? Even when we interact with systems. So for instance, detecting emotions can be a very good clue to understand the mood and how the user might want to interact with the system. So that is actually a prototype we built to detect emotion from facial expression through cameras. And we could detect more or less in a reasonable way sort of the six 
basic, there's some research on emotions, and we know there are different categories. One of the main categories is these six, that goes from happy to surprise, angry, disgust, fear, and sad. And um, what I'm doing now as research on this, I will show you later um, in another slide. Um, we are working on this on another project. This project is funded by Jaguar Land Rover. It's quite a big project. And we're looking at facial expression, drivers' facial expression, and how they react to different kind of interfaces you can show in the dashboard, to the infotainment system, to the navigation system, and how you can adapt these technologies depending on the reaction uh, that the user can have. Okay. So I think this is something in, in design that can be very relevant. So now we have good technologies, really, relatively reliable to detect emotions. So we can think about how people interact with systems, considering emotions as well. Uh, this one, the Collaborative Interaction Virtual Puppetry, uh, has been a work I did with a digital <coughs> artist, Semi Ryu. She's an expert on Korean puppets. She won quite a number of awards. And now she moved to the US. Actually, she's teaching arts in the uh, University of Virginia, I suppose. It's like Commonwealth University of Virginia, I suppose. And what we did there was, again, I was using, I always designed the prototypes but then work it with artists and designers to look together at the human side. I'm more kind of expert on the technology bit, but I really want to learn and try to speak another language, which is the language of designers, artists, looking at humans, because we want useful systems, really. So this was, the whole idea was to have a collaborative performance with those puppets. So basically, we had 3D models of the puppets, and the audience, could, for instance, animate part of the 3D model, and the rest was really coordinated by the, the puppet master, by the expert. Okay, so for instance, using cameras and gesture recognition, some people could, for instance, um, move one of the arms of the puppet, some others could rotate the head and do a few things. So it was interesting because uh, people had to coordinate to each other if we, they wanted to perform something. So there was collaboration and participation. That basically made the whole performance much more interactive and engaging. Especially we ran some experiments with kids, and they were super engaged, really, because they could even participate actively in the performance. And the performance was partially scripted, but of course they could change it you know, on the go. So it was quite interesting. And I'm still interested in developing this technology, because now we have very low cost um, devices like Microsoft Kinect, which you can detect gestures, and it's very low cost. So there's lots of things that can be done in sort of interactive performances actually involving the audience, right? Uh, this is one of the latest systems I'm working on, is an interactive display, okay? So the whole idea with inter interactive displays have a problem normally. And I saw some, some of those, actually, I'm planning to see whether I can use those to test it uh, in the library. I think there are four, like, inter problem with interactive display. Nobody really uses it, if you notice. There are people who use it the first time just to play with it a little bit, but they then won't use it. Why? Because there are mainly two big problems. One is called uh, display blindness, and one is called interaction blindness. In this prototype, we, fo we sort of focus on interaction blindness. So display blindness make mainly means that you go in front, you pass through or close to an interactive display, and you think that it's just a display. It's not interactive. And unless the display has a way of detecting you, as showing you that it's interactive, you perhaps might ignore it. Might think that it's just marketing or just information, right? This is a typical problem with those, which are expensive. And then, you know, they look nice, but they're not really used. And the interaction blindness is another problem that is a bit more specific, which is about, Im let's imagine that the display is able to attract the user, then the user has to discover how he or she can possibly interact with the display. So what are the gestures, you know, what are the, like, um, the comments that can be given to the display? So. We used in this display an avatar-based approach. So whenever the user gets closer to the display, an av this avatar will appear, 
and will actually mimic the movements of the user. So the user will know that the display is interactive, and moreover, instead of having a pointer, it's actually the user's own hands that can select different informations, play video. This is actually installed and working in a university in Italy, and it's like an information kiosk, which is, I think, is something to consider, because it's, it's sort of very engaging for students. From a research point of view, let's say the step further that we did, that is about um, natural user interfaces, the way of trying to provide a natural interaction, has been to remove the click gesture. There is a classic problem here. Again, the user has to guess how to click. Which gesture is right for clicking? That's not natural at all, because we're mimicking the WIMP interface, the mouse, keyboard, into a completely different interface. But the majority of those systems, you always have to choose a gesture. It can be like you know, a fist, or it can be this gesture, like a push, to sort of say, I'm selecting this. Uh, in this system, we came out with the design so that the user doesn't have to click, but can still select and browse the information. So it's more natural. It's the way you interact with it. So basically here, um, what we did is, if you stay for a while and we calibrate the, the amount of time you know, with your hand on a content, that means you are selecting that content. And we compare it to similar systems with a sort of a click gesture, and this is much more effective and simple for users. Um, I'm trying to wrap up quickly, sorry. Took more time than I thought, so. Uh, this is really the last topic I've been working on, uh, which is accessibility and universal design. So the whole idea is to make systems so they are accessible to many different people. So we're talking also about impaired, also about with people with some limitations, elderly. But actually, the principles are of universal design. So having this redundancy of information you will put in a, in a system actually help users in general. So imagine a lift, right, that is accessible. So for instance, a lift that has some speaker that would tell you the floor you're at. Of course, this is useful for, for people with low vision, because they can hear. But imagine you're carrying some bags, or you have a call on the phone. Well, you won't look right uh, at the numbers. You won't look at which floor you are. So this redundancy of having a voice telling you which floor you are, even if you're not impaired, is very useful. Because there are many situations in which, actually, this redundancy of information are useful in general for users. And those are principles of universal design. So I can show you. This is a prototype that was installed on a wheelchair. So um, was this lady, this was in Spain on a wheelchair. At that time, this was a this was few years ago, so not really iPad, but this was an ultra mobile PC anyway, with a camera. And what we did was actually getting information about their pos her position on the wheelchair and showing the corresponding, um, how's it called? I don't, don't remember now. Not really Google Maps, but like the, the sort of the 3D real image of Google Maps, the Google, how do you call it? Yeah, Google Street, Google Street. So Google Street. So that before choosing you know, to go on a certain pavement or road, she could see if there were obstacles. Because many times they have this problem, right? They turn like a corner, and then there's a street that is too narrow, or there are some obstacles, and you don't know. Of course, this wasn't in real time, so we were relying on Google updating this information, but it's, it's okay as a good sort of first approximation. Because many of the things of the obstacles are there. They're like, you know, bowlers or whatever that can actually prevent uh, someone in a wheelchair to go through that route, right, route. So, and this is another example. This is an app used with augmented reality. So basically as a map of a building in which you can see this augmented reality arrows that will show you evacuation routes in case of emergencies. Because one other problem is that when there's an emergency, we should read, you know, you go to a hotel, you should always read this plan for evacuation. Nobody really reads it, right? And when there's an emergency, you are panicking, and you need information quickly. So the whole idea here was to have an augmented reality guide that you could use on your phone. And while you were looking at a corridor, it would tell you exactly where to go through this 
augmented reality arrows. I can say one more thing quickly. The challenging bit here was really technology. Because imagine there's a fire or there's a, a power cut. You can't, really re you can't rely on GPS in a building because you know, reception is very poor, uh, if there is a reception at all. And um, you could use, we use Wi-Fi triangulation. So actually, you can use the Wi-Fi uh, routers that you have around to actually get an idea of your position quite precisely in a building. Thing is, we had like a challenge more. What happens during an emergency? You can, the, there might be no power at all, power cut. So the router based won't work. So what we did actually was um, create a sort of, um, we stole an OCR uh, scanning code. So basically you could see from the names on the, or the names of the room, the code of the room, or the names of people in that room could be actually coupled with a, a static map of the building. So worst case, you could scan the position, like the closest door with the name or a code, and then the system through a static map will know where you were, and we start to project this augmented reality anyway, in case there was no power, let's say. So there was an alternative. And then I would say concluding, I, I can mention just a few things really about the latest project I'm working on. So those projects you see here uh, are still ongoing projects. Some will finish next year. Um, I mentioned two already, so the Jaguar Land Rover project and the EPSRC project on innovations. Perhaps it's worth mentioning the, this last one that I just started in September, so this will last two years. And if someone's interest, uh, interested and wants to help or have a chat about it, this is about, this is funded by the Norwegian Research Council. It will last two years. And it's about um, basically loneliness. So it's about trying to take all with technology this big issue. And I saw the other day an article on The Guardian talking about UK with the same problem. So basically, you know, elderly, old people, they have their family is abroad or is not close, and they could spend even like weeks or even a month without talking to anybody. And this, of course, will lead to mental health issues and different kinds of health issues. So the whole idea in this system is about uh, designing objects. So we will start with the prototype on a smartphone, but then eventually we become an object augmented with technology that can be used to sort of stimulate those people to get in touch with others. So imagine a teacup that has some technology, like an NFC tag or something like this, that will connect to the system and call someone else at the same time of the day when perhaps someone else is having a cup of tea. And then perhaps you can have a conversation. You know, if we can think about, we're thinking about using like Google Home, you know, these devices you can talk to for the interaction. But again, I think part of my work has always been about tangible interactions with displays, objects. I think that objects are really powerful to people as a sort of a mediation. So we definitely look for objects there. So it might be of interest for designers as well. Um, uh, yeah, these are some of the contacts I have that I can share or we can sort of look at uh, for collaborate. So in academia, I would say Brad Myers, which is the a Human Computer Interaction Institute, Institute uh, Carnegie Mellon. Some other people, Steve Tanimoto, Gerard Fisher. I, if you know some of these names, of, if you want me to sort of bridge some contacts with some of those people, or some of those universities, we'd be more than happy to do it. In terms of industry, of course, Xerox Park, because I work there, but uh, this is the Mitsubishi. I am in touch with people at Google Research. Uh, Yahoo is, well, Elizabeth Churchill is not a Yahoo Research anymore because Yahoo disappeared. I think she moved to eBay, so she now works for eBay Research. And yeah, Microsoft and others. Well, Alex is now, he has his own spin off after Yahoo basically was uh, sold uh, in, in different pieces. I would say, I won't bore you with the last slides. I just want to show you a quick video of my last prototype that might be of interest for you, just as a source of inspiration for discussing things. This is about 
The platform I showed you before, the block-oriented programming with the smartphone. The whole idea of this, this prototype is a game-based learning. So this is a game meant to teach programming to, let's say, children, well, to, let's say teenagers, secondary school. So basically, they have a game in which they play alchemists, that they have to forge three different swords through their, and actually they are programming through the smartphone, they will program the game through the puzzle. The game will go on the, will be uploaded automatically on the smartphone, and they can use uh, Google Cardboard, which is a very low cost virtual reality device, and they can put the smartphone with the game on, on this device, and then watch the two knights fighting each other, following the strategy they program through the system. So it's a sort of an engaging way to teach programming. Uh, but the infrastructure is there, it can be used for other things, okay? More than happy to, to use it. See, they're using the smartphones, uh, and they're assembling the different sorts uh, with those sort of puzzle pieces. Yeah, they, they have three swords and three shields. The game will be in turns, they will fight each other. Um, and so you would see that we build around the halo a sort of a magnetic attraction. So depending on the shape, the pieces can be attracted or not. Like that one won't fit because it's squared. So we'd be, uh, uh, of course, every, every element they use will cost a certain amount of energy points and will give you a certain amount of force points. So you want to try to optimize for sp spending energy points for force points. And through the mechanism, actually, we're teaching programming. Then you have the three source, then you're going to forge to put together a shield. And when you finish, the game is on your smartphone. You programmed it, basically. Now you can put it on your Google Cardboard. And in virtual reality, you can see the two knights fighting each other following the strategy you programmed, right? Uh, and then, well, one eventually will win. These are two students that were my guinea pig. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you for asking.